Um, now we are on module 11, so the second and last of this semester. We're nearly there, uh, nearly there. Um, yeah, and, and also um, after this week, you, pro you, you, you probably um, have submitted all the assignments, so, you know, only the exam left, which is good. Um, we're getting there. Um, before we go uh, module 11, which is uh, on the uh, social and the environmental impacts of transport, uh, we just uh, quickly uh, revisit what we had last week. What was the topic, the module? Internet and transport system? Yeah. So anything particular? Yeah. Yeah. What's what's the key? Uh, we have uh, we talked about logistics. We talked about supply chain. What's the key? What's what was the key point of that module? If we back to our, the title of our unit, international transport system, so the key point is our transport fits in or in a different um, wording, um, what's the role of transport in logistics and uh, in supply chain? Is that correct? Like supply, like logistics is part of the supply chain and then transport is part, part of logistics. Yeah, import, very important component of logistics. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and also remember the diagram um, where we have the value added thing. Um, this is about logistics, but um, the key um, element of that system is is the transport. So, with lots of uh, um, ideas and the practice uh, innovations over the years, uh, without the transport, many of those will not be possible at all. Because we're talking about just in time, we're talking about reliability, we're talking about low cost, etc. Um, so. Transport um, plays important role, and you need to understand how this actually transport fits in the whole picture. Now, today we look at the impact of transport. We talk about lots of benefits, right? Um, and and if one day um, you know you find a job and you are in the workplace, and obviously what you needed to do probably most likely try to you know um, um, achieve very good um, performance or achieve high level of uh, profit for that business. And what you needed to do is, well, you try to increase your revenue, reduce your cost, and therefore you have a high profit um, margin. But with the benefits uh, brought by transport, we also um, have some side effects or some negative impacts. And many of those actually already been touched on in previous modules. And this module, um, to some extent, um, just to, to summarize what we actually had before in previous models, uh, uh, modules, when we look at the negative um, side of it, in addition to all the benefits we have um, from um, transport provision. And also, as you find, um, now this is uh, once again, as I said, you already completed the you are assigned for this particular unit. You submitted it, you have done it, forget it. Move on. Now, the question you ask is, well, we have submitted the assignment, and the, the assignment pretty much up to, say, well, last module, module 10. Now, what about module 11 and 12, the next two modules, including the one today, the impact of uh, transport in terms of the social side, the environmental side. And if you go back to the learning outcomes, and you'll find, well, there's something there needed to be assessed. How we assess it? Well, so after next week, we have a revision week, and you certainly will ask a question, and you really want to know what kind of questions will be in your exam. Think about this. Well, this is not 
assessed yet in your assignments, in your two quizzes. So this is going to be assessed in your exam. Am I clear? Very clear, right? So that's how we do it. I mean, it's not secret. Well, whatever we put there needed to be assessed. How we assess? If we haven't assessed you, we are going to assess you in the following assessment. That's what we do. Okay? So I made it very clear. So we look at the environmental impacts of transport, um, and we need to, uh, to look at the impacts of different uh, transport modes. Right? We look at the five, but mainly focus on four of those transport modes. We, look at, uh, we need to look at the, each of those, what the impacts are. How can such negative impacts on environment on environment be reduced? Yes, we know there are impacts, negative impacts, but how can we reduce it? We can't just say, well, sorry, well, because we need transport, nothing we can do to reduce it. Well, there are different ways um, of reducing the impact. And in the social impact side, what's the inequity issues associated with uh, transport? And you would say, well, yeah, well, mainly provide benefits. So what's the negative impact? We'll look at some of those negative impacts uh, brought by transport. So these are the topics we look at start from the beginning. We look at the environmental impact. We look at what are the energy consumption because this is the origin of the, uh, the impact, the environmental impact. And the forms of environmental impacts of transport, how to reduce the environmental impact and the social impact of it. Uh, gave you some numbers. Um, these numbers pretty much up to date. I, I actually did a little bit of work yesterday uh, to calculate it to find the most uh, risk numbers. Um, so I did some work. Now these are not necessarily well, um, standard. You can find something somewhere standard. Uh, okay, well, at the moment so the world uh, fossil fuel consumption uh, per day is 200 million barrels. Um, this is the crude oil equivalent. So you will find different measurements, but roughly converted back to how many barrels of oil, this is a crude oil, this is just one of the measurements, you, you can find the other measurements as well. So 200 million barrels a day, a lot, a lot, that's absolutely a lot, fossil fuel consumption. Now when we say fossil fuel consumption, this is not just the crude oil. Now coal also consider as fossil fuel, and the gas, all these considered their fossil fuel, right, the different form. Um, they are not renewable energy. Um, so 200 million equivalent barrels a day. And when it comes to transport, transport accounts for or consumes roughly around 25 to 30 percent. So that's up to nearly uh, probably um, 60 million barrels a day of energy fossil fuel consumed by transport. And from this you can work out what's the production level. We consume, every time when we consume fossil fuel, there will be associated portions to the air. And also in terms of around the world, different countries, we, we can say, well, OECD countries, um, 30, 38 number, members, uh, those are countries with developed economies, um, high level of living standards of those countries. Um, Roughly about 18% of the world population uh, consuming about 55% um, of the world transport energy. So once again, small population, less than 20%, but consuming over 55% of the um, transport energy. Um, I can tell you, um, back probably 10 years ago, this number even more dramatic. Um, the United States alone was small population Right, small population. Well, compared to Australia, it's it's, it's not small, but only 300 million people consumed 65 percent of the world energy on transport. Now that's back years ago, um, probably more than 10 years ago. The reason that the overall ratio percentage consumed by developed countries being reduced because we have the next point, right? Because this is relative. Overall, we have increasing consumption of fossil fuel, but the ratio between developed countries, the developed world and developing countries, well, developing countries consuming more, increasing, and probably developed countries 
growing slower. They're not necessarily stopped or decreasing, but the, the actual, the, the, the growing, uh, the growth rate lower than developing countries. So, uh, but still you see developed countries um, consumed more um, energy on transport. Now, can you give me some reasons why with a smaller, much smaller population, only less than 20% of the world population yet consume that much fossil fuel energy for transport? It's because of the activities of that 20%. What, what, what activities? Manufacturing and... Do you think manufacturing would be a reason for developed economies? We're talking about transport oh, energy. Yeah, sorry. I, I thought you were talking about less developed. The transport related energy consumption, developed countries consume, if, if we use per capita, certainly very, very high compared to those uh, in the developing countries. What, what are some reasons behind? Uh, maybe for the U.S. specifically, perhaps the U.S. military would have something to do. You would think the military would uh, consume lots of uh, um, fossil fuel energy uh, for transport. Yeah. Now, when they but they in war, possibly. But but it's it's uh, you, you don't always uh, we don't always have those war wars uh, large scale wars kind of thing. It's it's a transport. Consumption, fossil fuel, energy consumption in transport. And developed countries have very high per capita. What's the reason? It should be face to face. They have uh, cars. Yes, absolutely. This is the most obvious and one. A lot of underdeveloped countries does not have that many cars. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They have a very high level of car ownership for Australia. Australia is one of the highest in the world. And they travel longer. So they use lots of private cars um, and a certain much higher fuel consumption as compared to public transport. Now this is uh, the probably biggest reason out of many other reasons. Okay, um, So that's why, uh, and as I said, well, yes, back probably 10 or 15 years ago, um, this ratio between developed and developing countries is more dramatic. Uh, as I said, the United States alone consumed 65% of the energy related to transport, one country, right? It's, it's reduced, um, so this is the, o the overall OECD countries. And then you write to the, the freight side out. Now I'll give you, in the next few slides, so you'll find more um, about why this is the case. Now we have passenger transport and the freight transport, right? So this once again, just to prove the point, um, so it's mainly to do with uh, um, private car ownership and the use of the cars uh, because uh, we have passenger transport accounted probably for around 70% of the uh, fossil fuel right to transport. And then if we go with uh, different transport modes and then we find that land transport, land transport, or well, this is pretty much this road transport, um, 80%. Right, so once again, this is to do with cars, right? And for freight, that's trucks. Uh, we have the maritime side, only 7%, uh, moving um, over probably 90% of the world freight in volume, uh, but only consume the 7%. That's why shipping is so efficient. Um, and you, you are in the right course, um, you know, doing a study on the, on the maritime and, and the logistics side. Um, air transport, 80% um, um, still um, even higher than the maritime. Um, well, this is once again mainly related to passenger travel. Uh, rail and others, 5%. So for passenger transport, um, as I said, well, around 60 to 70% of total energy consumption by transport, and freight transport is 30 to 40%. Now, with those numbers, when we look at these are the facts, and because we understand there are some negative impacts and we need to come up with solutions to reduce the impact. How do we do it? We need to understand the facts, so we attack the main problems. So the problem is we have very high level of energy consumption for passenger cars, private cars. So what we do? We try to reduce 
the use of credit cards, right? How we do it? Well, we provide, well, we, you can't stop people traveling, but we provide alternative. So people use less private cars, and this is one of the solutions. Um, land transport, that's road transport consumes about 80%, very high maritime, as I said, moving over 90% of cross-border wood trade by volume, but only um, using 7% uh, of total energy used by transport, air transport, 8%. Um, so what exactly um, is the energy goes? Well, where the energy consumption is? Well, uh, we don't just talk about the, the fuel, the petrol we put into our cars well, every week, every two weeks, or on a monthly basis, but also the whole process, the whole process, because this is just operation, right? If, we, if you have a car, well, in order for you to use it, you regularly put petrol in, depending on how much you travel, um, well, it possibly weekly or uh, fortunately. Uh, but then the energy consumption right start, uh, will start actually right from the energy production. So you see, energy production and the trade will right from before we see any form of vehicle, we start from the energy. The extraction of energy requires energy import. And then we have construction and maintenance of transport infrastructure. So once again, energy import. And within we have the, uh, the vehicle operation, it's only part of it. And the percentage, we will be probably surprised, the percentage of that actually not as, as much probably as you would, would think. And then we have the maintain, vehicle maintenance and the maintenance, the disposal side, all requires energy input. So have a, dark, a, a rough, very rough um, estimate of the percentage of energy consumption at each um, stage. So energy use the energy generation and probably plus the transport side that's 17.4 so um, and all those eventually add up that 100 percent. Now this is just illustration only, uh, illustration only um, and the, the, the diagram produced years ago but as the technology improve especially engine technology and vehicle design um, the energy consumption in the operation actually re reduced. Now this is not surprising um, because that's what we've been doing. Try to reduce uh, the um, energy consumption per kilometer, for example. So uh, what we do, ha uh, how we do, um, obviously we improve our technology. Use more technology to improve the de design and the manufacturing structure. So what are the environmental impact? Well, um, land, this is the first thing, right? Uh, we need land for construction of road, uh, inf infrastructure required for support of road system, car park, etc. And um, here just use one example, uh, in larger cities in the UK, nearly one-fifth of the surface, entire surface, city surface covered by concrete just used for road, one-fifth. This is in addition to the buildings, um, so that's what we pretty much say. Well, in addition to the roads, whatever left will be used for road. Um, and the vehicle, if you have a car, well, I'll put a number here already, but um, you'll be surprised if you have a car, seven car parks will be waiting for just one car you own. So if you have one car, they must be roughly around seven car parks for you just for your car. And you think, <coughs> no, I only always need one. I have one at home. And if you go to supermarket, you have one in the supermarket. If you go to uh, um, a pub, well, you need to park your car somewhere. You have a car park. You go to airport. If you are in your car, you need a car park. <coughs> and then add up. All together, you need seven parking space for your one car. And that's the land space, the infrastructure we need to provide in order for you to find a parking space when you need it. Okay? Um, land loss or degraded as a result of mining for raw materials in the first place. Well, this kind of scenario we normally don't see, but it's, it's a problem. 
it's for a mining space, or it's especially for those open cut, right? So for coal, for example, coal mining in Australia, um, Australia has lots of open cut, so it starts from the surface, not underground. So they needed to strip off the top soil um, and then get a hole, and then what left is bigger holes and bigger holes everywhere. Um, and some of those are actually not reversible, which means you, you never recover. You never recover, restore um, the land into its previous um, condition. You never ever. What we possibly can do is reduce it, try whatever we can, uh, put plants on this or whatever else we do. But some of those, once damaged, once happened, never will be um, reversed. So that's the impact. That's the impact. What else you can think of? What else that you, you can think of? If I go to next one, because some of those we already touched before. What else you can think of? Air pollution? Noise. Yep. Lots of Noise? What else? What else? If we, if we go with the uh, the pollution side, uh, what the the uh, what's the uh, the um, the output of energy consumption? Well, the pollution, just in general sense, we have those pollutants, right? But uh, if we say, well, the emission emission is part of the uh, the outcome of uh, um, energy consumption, right? So uh, part of that sort of uh, um, output is, uh, say, well, the uh, carbon emission. What, what's the outcome or the, the consequence of carbon emission? Global <coughs> warming. Uh, an enhanced greenhouse effect. And Green, yeah, effect greenhouse, yes. And then global warming. What's the consequence of global warming? Sea level rise. Well, this yes. Well, we had uh, um, some discussions or well between the Pacific Island countries and Australia, etc. Uh, what else? Uh, extinction of animals. Yes. Desertification. Yeah. Place here in Australia. Extreme extreme weather conditions. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it goes on and on, right? Okay. Um, did you actually watch the uh, the video? Uh, video um, probably on YouTube um, about um, something happened. Probably was last week in the United Nations. Oh, Greta, Greta at the UN address. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, it's it's true. It's it's real. Um, the uh, climate change, as a result of um, um, greenhouse emission, well, it's real. We have more um, extreme um, weather conditions, including extreme temperature. We experience in Australia in different places. Uh, so it's it's very real. So these are these are the consequences and obviously impact to the um, um, to the uh, to the environment. So um, as we just mentioned, we have the carbon dioxide. That's uh, um, that's the uh, um, greenhouse emission, and then we have the carbon uh, monoxide as well. It's it's toxic um, carbon monoxide. And also in Australia, we have a bigger problem. We have very high UV level. Why? Mm -hmm. Because of the ozone layer. 
Yeah. It's, it's, it's thin. Yeah. It's now actually repairing. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's because it's seen, and some of those probably very much to, to the extent nothing there. So that's why we have very high UV level. There's no protection, and, and that's why Australians have a high rate of skin cancer as a result of the UV level. Um, and these are all these these things all real. Um, they're not fictitious. They will, um, and probably some to some extent probably worsening. Um, the consequence of air pollution um, we mentioned already. Uh, global warming is uh, is one of those uh, um, things, and the main consequence probably will have a huge impact on lots of other things. Um, so uh, sea level rise probably not a big issue for some countries, especially those countries inland, right? Landlocked countries will they have those mountains, they live those very hard places will not problem at all. There is no impact for them. But for many countries in islands, in the sea, well this is this is gonna have a probably gonna be a disaster. Well some of those islands or countries will disappear altogether. So we can't argue that because we live in a country we don't need to worry about the sea <coughs> rise because we're not going to impact it, so don't worry about it. Now this is exactly the inactive we talk about. Now the consequence, the cause of that temperature rise and eventually sea level rise while caused by somewhere else, the consequence will be on those people probably not produce much at all emission at all. So this is an inequity, but uh, we can't escape because this is, a, this is a world, this is a global for everyone. So whatever we do will affect others. So that's why the, go, the, the, the climate change or control of uh, emission is a global effort, is not a responsibility of a particular country. And also, when we talk about say, well, how actually contribute towards that climate change or emission, eventually we need to look at how much actually we consumed. It's not say, well, because it's uh, it's um, manufacturing producing lots of pollution, and therefore those so the countries with lots of manufacturing activities should cut. Well, to some extent that's true, but. It's eventually back to the end consumers. So think about this way. The more we consume, the more pollution we actually produce. Any questions? So yeah? Just on the, like, I just had this thought, is that with increased like, weather events, do you think uh, like dramatic weather events. Do you think that it will impact load lines on ships? Because they, you know how they've got like North American winter and all that sort of thing. You think they'll have to adjust them so that to make it that ships can't hold as much because there's more risk of adverse weather? Um, well, um, probably the adverse weather probably will not affect say, how much um, ships can carry or the design of those ships because uh, um, with the weather uh, forecast still there is a scope they can actually avoid but uh, with the climate change especially the rising temperature there's a longer time window for shipping actually for ships that go around the North Pole now that's happening so now it wasn't possible before many years ago but now it's possible and because this is a shorter road so this change accurate shipping, world shipping. So if, if you do doing ship up, well this is an area probably you want to sort of find some interesting article. We'll change um, shipping, world shipping to some extent because um, the rising temperature and the, you know, the time window can allow ship to safely go through that north, around North Pole much longer. Okay? Yeah. So there, there are 
sort of uh, um, mathematical modelings um, in terms of, say, um, a temperature rise, certain temperature rise, uh, and the possible consequences. Well, you still use, you you can see both sides of argument, and some some people simply say, well, um, climate change um, is not true, right? The global warming is a lie. Um, well, um, because scientifically, you can have both sides. You have you, you can have both sides. Well, you know, after temperature rise to a certain degree, and then there will be a time when the temperature actually drops. Um, so, um, but. You find actually you find lots more evidence um, that the temperature is rising, and we have overall trend of global warming, and obviously more extreme weather conditions, and many of those associated with obviously um, the, the, the the pollution uh, we actually will produce. Um, with the pollution, those different prot uh, proteins, um, we have part of that problem is uh, um, acid rain, right? Acid rain. Um, acid rain will cause lots of problems. Um, cause lots of problems um, to the forest, uh, to the water, uh, to the water. Um, so uh, we'll have very large scale um, on the planet. It's not just on those uh, uh, green plants, uh, but also on water. And then we've got lots of problems with uh, respiratory ailment, cancers, um, skin cancers, for example, um, in Australia, uh, because of uh, exposure to a very high level of UV. Uh, we mentioned noise and the vibration. Noise and the vibration we can experience every day on a daily basis. If you drive your car, you can always experience vibration when you have a, um, a larger truck just next to your car, you can feel vibration, right? And uh, noise, well, um, if you live on a, just next to a busy road, you always uh, hear the noise um, on the roadside, and then in some areas are probably noise from rail as well, and around the airport, uh, in Sydney, in particular, I mentioned in previous module, um, Sydney Airport has a curfew, which means so well, after 11 o'clock and then early in the morning, uh, no takeoff landing. Um, this is just a part of the control of the noise, because the fact is the airport is in the, in the center, in the heart of that city. So noise, um, noise control. Um, and the noise control some, sometimes can be very detrimental uh, to people's health. Right, to people's health. Um, with the, once again, we're back to the technology part. We can actually now design those engines um, well, with uh, less um, noise level, but it's still the noise. As compared to you have, you don't have traffic. Right? Regardless of w how well or what ad uh, how advanced the technology is, well, you still the vehicles still have quite noise. Vibration can cause lots of uh, damage, structural damage to uh, to buildings. Uh, to buildings, so we have noise and um, um, and the vibration, uh, traffic um, congestion. Now, if we look at it individually, different transport modes, um, the congestion levels probably different across different transport mode. Um, but the interesting thing, or the interesting phenomenon we have observed, is on the road transport because this is the most uh, um, the, the uh, transport mode that we're most familiar with. Um, so we always experience congestion to some extent. Even in losses in such a small town, you still experience, experience um, congestion, right? Have you? Yeah. Right? In the morning, well, we say morning and the afternoon peak, right? Well, uh, it's congestion. Well, it's also, it's, it's not say, well, hours and hours, but it's, it's congestion. And then the argument is, the argument is, so if we c have congestion, let's put more road. If we have the means, we have the finan financial resources, if the land is available, we put more um, roads. Well, then you attract more traffic, and then you create more problems. Huh? So it's not a simple solution because we have congestion, so let's have more infrastructure. Um, before we have infrastructure, the first thing we probably do is to how to make them more efficient, 
how can we have more traffic with the, on the existing infrastructure through technology, through traffic management. Uh, with congestion, we got lots of other problems because it's quite likely with serious bad congestion, we have more accidents, right? Um, there's a term called road road anger, I think. Road Some rage. Road rage. Right. Road rage. Road rage. <laughs> anger is, is, is yes, not enough to describe this. And there are many cases, like in the United States, will even result in killing. Well, part of that is because of congestion. People just get irritated, right? So, and, and it causes lots of other problems. Now, when congestion, you have to stop uh, your car, but you can't stop your engine. So the engine is idle. When the engine is idle, it produces more pollution. Now, when you drive 100 kilometers an hour, the pollution is much less as compared to when the engine is idle, you stop your car there, but you can't stop your engine. So when we have the truck very slow traffic or the traffic simply not moving, well, we actually waste the energy, produce more pollution. Okay? Yes? Just on that, in Sydney, when there's like accidents and stuff, yeah. um, and there's like, because Sydney has quite an extensive tunnel network, Yeah. Um, if there's an accident and you get, like people are stuck in the tunnel, they'll actually come over the radio and turn you, tell you to turn your car off, so yeah. you're not A, wasting petrol, and B, creating emissions. Yeah. So, I think that's what Well, this is probably one of the examples we use the technology uh, to manage the, the traffic. And in some cities around the world, uh, even more advanced technology, real-time monitoring of the traffic and uh, using the traffic condition to actually to guide uh, drivers uh, to avoid, um, you know, worsening the uh, the congestion situation. Um, and also um, that case in Sydney, once again, very interesting case here. Um, you know, we rely on very much the tunnel and the bridge. Well, we don't have other options. Um, and then if uh, something really bad happened, you will, you pretty much, will, the whole traffic will, will, will be stopped altogether. Um, but this, once again, this, this is something um, we, we can do, use the technology, sensor technology uh, for real-time uh, monitoring of traffic um, and to better utilize the infrastructure we have. Okay? Uh, and in next module, in next module, we'll look at the policy and the planning side to address the, the congestion. But uh, today we just look at well, what are the impacts, okay? And also, um, I forgot to mention here, when we have very serious congestion, we'll, we lose um, productivity. So you ask in large cities, it's not uncommon for people to actually spend a uh, couple of hours each day, probably sometimes, in some cases, probably up to four hours a day, morning, afternoon, two hours each on the road for their work. So four hours on road. Now for me, it takes me probably 12 minutes, always roughly 12 minutes from my home to my workplace in the uni. So I think pretty, pretty good, very much blessed. In London, uh, I think it was London, we learned about this last year or something. They actually have implemented that uh, in different suburbs of London. Yeah. It's like, okay, you guys uh, start work at 7, you yep. guys start work at 8, and you guys start work at 9 to deal with like the congestion. Yeah, absolutely. This this is something certainly a practice probably many cities in the world, large cities in the world probably implement because it's uh, it's uh, part of the solution to the peak. So the, the the fact that we have peak traffic because we start at nine o'clock or start at eight o'clock, and this is a very good way. And some people even prefer start earlier, finish earlier. Uh, while others will, um, you know, they start 
light in the day and finish in the day. Yeah, so this is one of the ways we can actually we can use to actually control uh, the traffic on road at a different time of the day. Uh, another interesting case that I can think of is Indonesia. Yeah. With their capital city Jakarta, I think. Yeah. The, the government is planning to move the capital city to I can't remember the name of the place they're going to move it to, but something there was a study about how like thirty percent or twenty percent of the productivity of Jakarta is uh, wasted because congestion. Yeah. And so they're moving their capital to somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. They have the plan. They already approved the plan. They are going to move their capital. Um, we don't know yet um, how long this is going to take, but this is obviously to address the problem. Very dense population and very bad traffic. Uh, what you can do will move, uh, move. And the other areas uh, probably move um, the functions of a capital city. Right? Um, so, um, and in Australia, if you look at the, the capital city we have here, um, Canberra, uh, it's not a large city, but once again, if you look at, because this is a very young city, it's, it's a capital, and, and probably well, one of the youngest probably in the world in terms of a capital city. Um, so therefore, it's young, so the design, initial design was very advanced, it was a very good concept. If you go to Canberra, you'll find that actually they designed the city, the entire city, uh, in a way that they have multiple centers, or satellite centers, if you like. They not say, well, this is in the middle, uh, north, um, central north and the cen central south, and that's it. Well, they have different centers right around the capital area so that they don't have sort of huge concentration of workplace population or traffic in the center. And in fact, the departments because this is a capital city, the, obviously the main function, main activities around you know, the government, right? And they have actually departments actually scattered around the city, not concentrated in one area. So this is uh, the design, the initial design. And this is obviously the main concern is traffic. Okay? Now tomorrow, next module, sorry, uh, next module we'll look at it, more examples um, of um, you know, how we can actually do something um, with, uh, with the, the problems. Um, land use, um, well this is uh, individual model, I think, in module, uh, individual transport uh, modes. Um, I think I'll probably stop here. Yeah. Um, I'll stop here, let's have a break, come back at 11. Okay, guys. Um, let's uh, back to uh, go back to our slides. You ready? Yes. Um, well, as I said in the beginning, different transport modes have different level of impact to the environment and probably on the social side as well. So we need to look at it individually, um, how they impact, uh, how it impacts um, on the environment. So the first one we look at it well, uh, in, term of, in terms of land use, um, will still require land, obviously, for uh, trucks as the infrastructure and then the terminals, etc. But lower, the requirements lower than road. Uh, more efficient energy consumption, right? more efficient energy consumption, especially when we look at a per passenger, so much lower. Now there's another thing we can look at. Well, the energy consumption is lower than road, but also we can actually use other means. If we use uh, um, the electrified um, system, uh, electricity is, as the uh, energy input, then we can have other options. 
for rep. Um, less corrosion, um, especially when we use uh, um, electricity, because we have the option of using uh, electricity generated by uh, renewable means. Higher noise and vibration level, uh, but with new technology, uh, we can actually reduce the noise and vibration level, but still, uh, it creates uh, noise and the vibration. Uh, normally, no congestion in most circumstances. Well, normally, because um, if the truck rail trucks on road on the surface and, and of course with uh, road infrastructure, uh, rail always has the right of way, which means road vehicle vehicles on road must stop until it's clear. Until it's clear. Um, now, there are cases where we have good congestion. Well, it's, it's designed, if it's designed just for single direction, and then the congestion means they're not really stop in the middle uh, on track, but rather they have marshalling um, rows, so a train probably needs to wait until one pass and then go uh, continue on. But with the two direction, um, this situation certainly will be much better. For air transport, um, well, we don't really need the land for the way because it's in the air, but we still need to have very large land space for the terminals, for terminals, and also including maintenance area. And a very high level of energy consumption. And this is why, this is why um, it's so expensive. Bless you. Uh, this is this is why it's so expensive because very high level of energy consumption, and because air transport is higher in the sky, so wind created emission will will cause more damage as compared to when we actually have uh, um, emission um, on the road. Now, part of that is if you consider say well if we have trees, those plants because they are actually will considered as the lungs of the earth. If we have more green, um, so uh, plants, then they can actually convert the uh, um, CO2 into um, non-harmful, well, it's pretty much uh, oxygen, in this case, as the output. Now, for the road transport, the emission can be, some of those will be absorbed, right, and converted into oxygen. But it's not possible high in the air. When created high in the air, they're not coming back to the earth. So that's the problem. Um, so cause more problems when um, high in the air by air transport. Um, very high level of noise during takeoff in the landing. I mentioned this already. No, not, not normally, uh, we don't have congestion problem in most of the circumstances, right? But um, we understand that, well, even also we don't see the the land, the air lands in the air, but they are lands in fact, and the possible congestion will be created around airports, terminal. So we, it's it's not kind of unlimited capacity for airports. Well, airports are actually in fact in limited with the space above, right? With the space above. So that's why we have air traffic control and. Um, the better we actually have the control, the higher the volume or the number of um, aircraft we can actually accommodate, accommodate in an airport. Now, in the airport, um, we normally see what? Are you alright? Alright? Now, in the airport, normally what we see, probably more right to the capacity, is the how many runways we have, right? So therefore, um, how many aircraft we can actually accommodate at any given time. Right? Within our we can have say probably 60 aircraft that take off or an, an landing uh, and then we can have multiple lanes but you need to consider above the air as well. Now with this new technology we can possibly um, not through the human beings so when we try to actually maximize the number of aircraft in the airport we actually use um, technology use uh, modeling with optimization pretty much. So some of you probably 
you know, do unit in you know, optimization. So this is a tool we use to optimize the number of aircraft we can handle in the airport. Um, so um, say crewing, for example. Um, so 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 the technologies we possibly can increase, but sometimes when it comes to congestion, sometimes we still have that problem. And don't forget, even in the air, sometimes we have a restriction in certain areas, and this will cause delay. Cause delay. Um, waterway, um, land to use, um, very similar to air transport. Uh, we don't really need the land as the way because we're in the water for ships, um, so either in the river or in the ocean, but we still need a very large area for terminals. So this is very similar to um, air transport and very efficient on energy consumption. Well, very, very efficient. We compared this before. Well, we have very large ca capacity and very low uh, unit um, energy consumption. And also, of course, the speed is much lower compared to um, other means of transport, except the uh, pipeline transport, right? It's the slowest. Um, marine pollution, well, yes, well, um, it's very efficient. Energy, in terms of energy consumption, very efficient. But we still have incidents of uh, marine pollution. Marine pollution. And also, um, another thing you probably want to think about is, well, um, some, well, in terms of the general public, uh, we always have a very bad impression of um, pollution caused by um, shipping activity, right? Because you are doing this particular degree. So you need to understand. Um, now, public perception sometimes is different from the reality. When we look at well, the pollution, well, between water transport and road transport, obviously road transport causes much, much, much more, significantly more pollution as compared to shipping. But why the general public sometimes has a very bad impression of shipping because it's, it's, it's very much publicized if there is a marine accident or cause marine pollution, right? So that's why. And, and also, well, it's still, even with the technology, with all the um, international conventions, marine pollution still occur, um, still occurs. Um, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's uh, caused by um, accident. Um, sometimes it's uh, just uh, as part of the uh, um, daily operation. Um, and also we have other problems, say, well, invasive marine species, so this is probably not really to do with the energy consumption, but it's part of our problem, shipping activity. We have um, invasive marine species because they could attach to the ship hull, and then we move to the next um, port, um, probably will release. So that's, that's how ships actually carry those species um, uh, through um, the ships. Um, congestion, well, um, not not in terms of in the ocean. We normally don't have that problem, right? Although we have the shipping land, these are the optimal lengths or routes we go uh, for for shipping. Um, we consider weather condition. We consider the um, the activities in in the ocean. Uh, we consider the the safety of that. But uh, when it comes to narrow channel or strait there is a possibility of congestion. So once again, this is not unlimited. So a good example probably we can think of is Singapore, uh, Singapore Strait. We have very large number of ships um, going through that strait. Um, can we possibly have congestion? Well, it's possible. If we have an accident in there, and we possibly create uh, congestion, and in other areas where we have what we call vessel traffic control, uh, or vessel traffic system, and especially in those narrow streets, um, there is a possibility that we actually have some sort of congestion. Uh, but congestion is probably for shipping, for waterway transport is more common in port areas, similar to, um, to air transport. So the congestion possibly occur in around the ports, in ports. Now what that means, well, simply because when there are too many ships and the shore side simply do not have that capacity to handle those ships on time. So ships have stopped in the anchorage, uh, wait for days, for hours or four days, um, sometimes even longer, right? Uh, in Australia, some ports experience, experienced a very severe condition. Um, so it's uh, in the east coast side for coal terminal back years ago, uh, because very high demand and a large number of ships, and therefore uh, the shore side cannot actually um, handle 
could not handle actually the, um, the large number of ships, therefore caused significant delay um, on those ships. And this kind of situation are considered as condition. Um, pipeline. Um, well, this is the fifth transport mode we look at. It. Um, very limited land um, use, especially when buried underground. So e virtually none land use because when buried, you can still use the land uh, on the top. And in fact, the, the pipeline not normally huge, right? It's it's probably just a meter, a couple of meter in diameter, um, diameter. Um, and, and uh, that's pretty much that's all. Very, very efficient and most efficient way if we talk about the five transport modes in terms of energy consumption. And very low, because very low energy consumption, so therefore negligible pollution, very low level um, pollution. But as long as we have any energy input, there will be um, pollution. And if we go back to the energy, initial energy expression, well, how about the material, you know? The raw material extraction of the mod, ma raw material for the pipeline, uh, the manufacturing of the pipeline, etc. still, uh, but compared to other transport modes, this is very low. Um, no uh, noise and vibration, and no congestion, unless there's a problem. So the pipeline entirely stopped, but otherwise there's no, it's not designed that you can possibly have a congestion, because it's one way. It's always one way. Uh, you can't get, go both ways. Other transport modes, you have both ways, but uh, apart from one, you have only one way. So you don't, that's why you don't find anything say, well, you have a congestion in your water park. Uh, no, you always, you always either have water or you don't. When you don't have the water, it's not caused by congestion. Um, so uh, how do we reduce the pollution? So as the, the, the impact, the environment impacts uh, we look at it, and the pollution is one of the major um, problem. Uh, what we can do um, to actually reduce that impact. So we can have biofuel. So fuel can be fossil fuel, but can be biofuel. Uh, fossil fuel is not renewable. Uh, once we extract and use, it never come back. It never comes back. So uh, and obviously there will be proteins, but we can use actually biofuel um, from sugar cane, or corn, and cereal, those kind of things. It's, it's from the veggie, the plants, right? And it's renewable. Ob obviously you can uh, plant next year and then you harvest. So we can uh, extract biofuel um, from those plants. Um, hydrogen, um, cost and efficiency of production, at the moment it's, it's uh, um, still limited use because of uh, the technology we have and the high cost um, and also requirements on the storage. Uh, electricity well, or hybrid, well, it's much more common. Even we have uh, vehicles on the road, we have full electric cars. Um, now when we use electric, uh, el uh, electricity uh, as, a, as, a, as a main source of energy, it's not so well because uh, uh, electricity will uh, require less import and and therefore less pollution or no pollution. We use electricity. You, there's no pollution, no direct pollution. Uh, pollution. But there will be um, indirect uh, input, energy input, or indirect pollution as well. Um, but another point here is when we can use electricity as the power, as the energy input, we have alternatives. If you use fossil fuel, that's it. <coughs> fossil fuel, right? If you use for, consume fossil fuel. If you, you use up, it's not coming back, it's not renewable, you have the uh, proteins. But use the electricity, we can use it renewable. So it's, it can be wind, from wind. It can be from wave. So maritime engineering, they have lots of uh, uh, research there uh, to, to utilize the wave, create energy, create electricity. Wind turbine, same thing. Solar, um, arch. Hydro um, electricity, so all those renewable, renewable, and of course sometimes we argue say, well, what's the in input energy, especially for solar panel, uh, for solar panel. So we can actually work out what's the initial input and what's the ongoing benefits, and eventually we work out to say, well, whether this actually we actually create some positive impact by using solar uh, power. Um, hybrid um, electric uh, efficiency gains by using uh, internal combustion um, 
engine as well as the electric motor and batteries is certainly benefits um, on on the road um, and even less noise so more efficient and certainly less pollution because this is once again this is low level pollution from the road will have most impact on human being um, air pollution well, regulations on emission control and once again this is uh, this is something not necessarily will be easily agreed uh, even within one country and not uh, let alone say well across many different countries well how do we control emission what's the target well can we actually agree upon say well what's the reduction level for each country and sometimes we'll we argue, say, well, um, this is uh, wrong, this is a lie. Uh, if we have control, because anything you do to control uh, emission, there will be a cost associated with it. It could cause some damage to the economy as well. Um, but the overall trend is that we need to actually control emission. How we do it, well, we can discuss, but this is something we have to do. If we don't do it now, probably will be too late um, in 50 years' time. Um, innovation from manufacturers, change engine size, efficiency, uh, or use alternative power, uh, lot, uh, body weight, etc. All those things we can do possibly to improve our vehicle, to make vehicles more efficient and therefore less energy consumption and less pollution. Development of public transport, uh, we mentioned already. Uh, the, the biggest reason for the developed countries to use more fossil fuel compared to those developing countries pretty much private car use. So if we use more public transport, less cars will be on road and therefore less, obviously, less pollution. The willingness of people to change their lifestyle, well, using private cars is one of those things that people prefer, right? Um, and also um, the fact that we change the work time, the pattern, right? As Maria just mentioned, well, um, in some cities we have actually um, different arrangements for different districts in that city. So s people st start work at different time slot and therefore reduce the peaks. Um, so we utilize, we better utilize the existing infrastructure and create a lot um, uh, less problems. Um, land use, uh, how do we actually reduce uh, the impact of the land use of well, vegetation? Um, of roadside, railway, verges, exactly. Well, this is just the limit, some of the limited things that we can do. We can't actually say, well, let's remove those roads and plant trees there. You still need, we still need the road inf infrastructure, but we can do something to reduce the impact. So if we put plants around road or road trucks, we can have quite a sort of a, a barrier uh, for the noise, to control the noise. Reduce the length of runways by creating short takeoff and landing um, airports. So that's right to technology. For example, uh, Airbus um, 380, largest aircraft, the passenger aircraft, um, but the takeoff, the, the runway required for that largest aircraft, the same. It doesn't require longer um, takeoff. Uh, so that's to do with the technology. Limitation on vehicle access to airports. So we use other means of transport, uh, so we can actually reduce the, the land required for, for parking, for example. Legislation to ensure mining and aquarium companies restore sites by removing waste materials, replanting vegetation. Uh, as I mentioned, well, some of those landscape will be never reversed or restored to their original state, but if we do something, certainly better than nothing. Um, Reducing pollution at the sea, that's the marine pollution side. So we have lots of uh, international conventions already. Uh, it's more probably to do with the enforcement side. Enforcement side. So if you're doing um, other units, uh, the uh, transport law side, uh, even probably ship ops probably will also mention this. Um, one of those uh, conventions is uh, Amapo International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships. Um, so this created those laws commissions. Um, as I said, um, one thing we probably can do better is the enforcement. Um, technology development, we certainly have developed technology, so the, um, um, 
the efficiency of engine has been improved, and that's why we say one thing: we actually construct and design larger ships, larger ships. So this reduces the unit um, emission. Um, the other side is the efficiency of the engine being being improved, and always it's a continual process. Uh, monitoring. So this is to do with the enforcement. If we have better monitoring of marine pollution, well, obviously <coughs> there will be less pollution um, from ships. Now, sometimes it's not because say, well, um, the technology is not good. Sometimes it can be, as I mentioned, uh, intentional release of waste from the ship, or sometimes e even um, oil, because say if. Uh, from the washing of the, the ships, um, the hair, sometimes, uh, and this actually, in fact, um, accounts for a larger percentage of oil pollution, repeated operation. But uh, uh, part of that is because of the monitoring. Uh, some, sometimes, say, well, they far away from the shore, say, well, no one will see them, so they think they do it. So with better monitoring, we certainly have a high level of enforcement. Uh, upon those already existing conventions and therefore reduce the marine pollution. Um, how do we reduce noise and vibration? Well, reducing traffic bump, making more and better use of public transport, well, we remove uh, the number of uh, vehicles on road, allowing people in proper occupation to work at home. I wish I could work at home, um, and, and I would probably work at the same efficiency level, uh, probably high, um, but, uh, well, um, some um, organizations, business allow people to work at home. So um, pretty much uh, reduced um, the need or um, significantly reduced need for, um, for transport. Um, encouraging people to drive more sensibly. Um, on roads you'll find people drive in a very different way, right? Some people are very sensible, while other people are not. Um, sometimes it's just a simple habit. You, so you have a very fast start and, and a very um, sudden sharp stop all the time. And sometimes people deliberately make noise. They, they, they put some mufflers, create a huge noise deliberately because they think this is very cool. Now we have the noise problem already, but yet they still uh, try to create more noise because it's cool. Um, so this once again, this is uh, this is the education um, process. Uh, people need to be sensible on road, and um, by drive sensibly, we can actually uh, do quite a lot. Engine redesign mentioned uh, quite a few times. So I'll, I'll probably just skip through. Uh, road surface. This is another thing we can possibly do. Uh, we can improve the road surface uh, so the noise level can be reduced. Um, still maintain the, obviously maintain the, um, um, the safety because the fact that we have the road, uh, we can reduce it, but we say needed to maintain the safety because we still need to have maintain certain friction level to make sure it's 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 uh, it's safe um, for driving on that kind of surface. Um, screen plants alongside the road mentioned already. So if we plant. Um, trees along roads or uh, rail trucks, we can actually use this as a barrier uh, to stop um, some, some of the noise, at least, if not completely. Um, traffic congestion, this is uh, one of the main, pro uh, main problems we have experienced, always experienced on the, um, on the roads. So one thing, we reduced private cars on roads because this probably has the largest uh, percentage uh, of, of, uh, of the traffic, uh, overall traffic. So we reduce the number of small cars because uh, you have a small car, it, yes, compared to a bus, well, it's much smaller. But think about it. Most of the time you see actually cars only have one passenger in those cars, right? So it's extremely inefficient, Effic extremely inefficient. So. Um, if we can provide a public transport, um, certainly this will reduce the number of vehicles on road and therefore uh, reduce the problem of congestion. Improving traffic flows through different timing of traffic loss. Now this is the op optimization um, problem. So we can, with the uh, existing infrastructure and existing traffic, we can make it much better through optimization um, of 
uh, the um, the traffic lights. So at any given time, we can allow maximum number of vehicles going through um, the road. Uh, creating bypasses around cities and the town. So those traffic uh, don't need to go through the city will bypass uh, bypass the city. Use of information technology. We discussed this already, and um, sometimes it can be systematic. So we have those system, intelligent transport system, for example. So uh, it's not just to say, well, uh, broadcast, uh, provide the information, say, well, there's a section of road, uh, can just uh, um, stuck to say you don't go there. No, it's much more complicated than this. You all right? We're almost at the time. Um, so the next bit is the social impact of it. Social impact. So we, we think we can think of lots and lots of benefits brought by um, transport. And in fact, we started this unit by looking at the significance, the importance of of transport. Right? <coughs> but with the, all the benefits we have, some negative impacts on the social side. Um, affordability. You have a reading there. Affordability, well, most of the time we probably take it for granted. Um, you have your car, your own car. If you don't have a car, at least say, well, whenever I want to, to go, I can afford it in a public transport at least, or there is always a public transport there waiting for you. Uh, this is not always the case. There are people that can't afford their own car, and there are areas not serviced by public transport. So this is an uh, inequity. Um, KG22, what that means? Well, KG22 means, well, in order for you, well, put it this way, well, we have the, always have the chicken and the egg kind of uh, um, argument, which comes first. The KG22 is, a, is, is one of those things where people needed to go to work in order for them to earn the income and so that they can afford their own car, right? For their mobility, so they can find uh, jobs. But without the vehicle, they can't probably find the jobs, suitable jobs. So they can't earn the income. Without the income, they can't, they never be able to afford a car. So this is a vicious cycle, KG22. Um, now, there are certainly um, many um, people uh, in any countries would, have, would be in that kind of situation. So somehow we need to break it. Well, this could be at the individual level. It could be at national level. As I mentioned, when we look at the first couple of modules, uh, we look at well, what's the relationship between transport uh, and economic development, and the same thing, which we start first, right? Which we start first, and also accessibility versus mobility. So we have uh, the trend. There has been trend. To uh, dispersion of shopping centers, medical facilities, um, schools, along with the inadequate public transport. Um, so now with the public transport, we say, well, we, yes, we need to provide a public transport in order for the people to not travel in their own cars. But yet, uh, on the other side, uh, especially in Australia, uh, we have very large area, and the density of population is very low. And this creates this creates lots of problems as compared to otherwise we have uh, dense population. Right? So when, with the dense population, you can actually provide um, public transport, and the benefit of public providing public transport is uh, greater, much greater. Transport and the quality of life. This is obviously a social aspect of it. Increased mobility for those who can afford. So as mentioned, well, no problem if people are rich. They can afford for their cars, for travels, etc. It's there. It's always there for them. But as I said, we can't take it for granted because people around the world or in the same country, there are people can and there are people can't. Um, rapid trans transit of vast quantity of raw materials and finished products, the, 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 uh, the trade and uh, the, the variety um, of products we can have, well, these are the, some of those, those benefits, right? Um, but also, at the same time, we have increase in transport accident. In fact, people killed in transport, the number of people killed in transport on roads, probably more than those people actually killed in war. So 
Um, it's a serious problem. In Australia, well, well Australia has a well, relatively good rec record compared to many countries in the world. But you can find those, n those numbers on, on, on their website. It's, a, it's a published information as how many actual people killed on roads um, every week, every month, every year, or during a particular festival season. So still, uh, we have those accidents. And in some countries, this is uh, uh, even, even worse. Uh, what's an inclusion? The rich, the rich produce, the poor help to pay the bill. Uh, I mentioned them, right? Those island countries, Pacific island countries, for example, they don't probably consume as much as most of the most developed countries, but they probably take more of the consequences. Because if the temperature continues to rise, well, some of those islands will disappear. See, so this is an inequity. No? It's, it's not something they have done. It's, it's something others have done to them, and they bear the, the consequences. So that's pretty much what, what we have for this week. Um, so remember, we you know, discuss, uh, look at those uh, um, impacts, and in the next module, we have one more module to go before we finish everything. Um, next module, we'll look at the planning side, the policy side, policy side how actually we can utilize uh, planning and the policy to address um, the um, the negative impacts we have identified in this module. Any questions before you go? Um, now, once again, uh, I just uh, want to keep saying this, uh, and uh, hopefully will encourage you. Um, now it's it's uh, the second last. So we have one module to go. Uh, before we stop it, we have uh, another revision. So uh, two more weeks uh, we meet, and we're done. Um, now you have. Um, done so far, you have done uh, quite a lot um, in this semester, not just in this unit, but in other <coughs> units as well. So um, continue with the work, good work you have done so far, and if you have any problems, um, let me know. Don't wait. Let's always address any problems you may have, or any assistance or help you need, and make sure that we get done nicely. Okay. All right. Okay. No pro if no problem, we we'll see you next. I'll see you next week.